Like I said, I'm glad you're here with us this morning, and believe it or not, we're actually going to be finishing and wrapping up this series on follow. It seems like we've been in it forever, and we've been in it for two months now. We've been talking about this, and, and, and we've been talking about the fact that when Jesus walked on the face of this earth, he came up to everybody that he was around and stuff, and he said those two words, follow me. Follow me. That was an invitation he gave to everybody, no matter who you were or whatever. And it's an invitation that he still gives to us sitting right here today, that are gathered right here today. And as I was thinking about how do I wrap this up, how do I illustrate, how do I take everything that we've learned and, and wrap it all together and bring it to a close for us, I, one of the things that was going through my mind is I wonder, I wonder why it is we have to spend two months talking about what it's like to follow Jesus. What, what is the difficulty for us if we call ourselves Christians, if we call ourselves disciples of Christ? Why do we struggle so hard with understanding of what it truly means to follow Christ? And one of the, one of the reasons, and I think it's a big reason that we struggle, is because I think we all have different perspectives when it comes to that aspect with it. And we have different perspectives because we all come from different places, you know. You're, we, you know, you're raised in different places, and, and, and so how you're raised, how you're taught, what you experience, whatever, you know, you take all of that, and when you go to answer something, when you go to see how something can be done, that's your perspective of how that should be. Like, for instance, I was raised in Newton, Iowa. It used to be the home of Maytag. And that was raised there, a town of about 15,000. Football was the only real sport that there was uh, back then. I mean, there were other sports, but the only thing that anybody really talked about, cared about, was Friday night football. Um, all year long it was talked about when it came to that. You know, my, my dad was a Maytagger. I was raised in a community that on Sunday night, if you didn't get what you needed Sunday night, midnight, you ain't getting it till my, uh, or excuse me, if you didn't get it Saturday night, midnight, you weren't getting it till Sunday night, midnight, because for 24 hours, everything closed. The only thing that was open was the hospital. That was it. You know, I can, remember, I can remember my senior year of high school, there was a gas station that decided to open up at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And I thought they were going to run them out on a railroad, you know, because you just, I mean, that's the kind of community that I was raised within, you know. And, and I was raised in, in a church, a, the Catholic church. Uh, it was my background and stuff. And so, you know, all of that makes me who I am. And, and you could be different. You could have been raised in a larger community, uh, you know, a, a city you know, setting when it comes to that. Maybe even a smaller community you could have been raised with. I have myself and my sister. There's eight years between us. You might be an only child. You might, you know, you might have eight siblings I, when it comes down to that aspect. Myself, I've been blessed. My parents, uh, what is it, 63, four or five years that they've been married, 63 years they've been married. I know some of you come from families where parents got a divorce. So we have all these things that make us in our background that when, when we come to look at something, when we come how we're going to do something, we decide, hey, this is what this means. We have all of this that makes us have this different perspective, which can bring some misunderstanding in there. And, you know, because we have these different perspectives. And let me see if I can illustrate what I mean by different perspective. When it comes to this story I heard all the way back, it's a little children's story called Mr. Snail, Mr. Snail Takes a Journey. Mr. Snail decides he's going to take a journey and that, and so he packs up his shell, gets it all full of everything that he needs to take his journey, and he sets out on his journey. And as Mr. Snail's going out on his journey, you know, looking at everything and experiencing life, along comes Mr. Turtle It's starting to pass him. And Mr. Turtle stops and he says, well, Mr. Snail, I seem to be heading in the same direction you were going for right now. Would you like to hop on my shell? And at least while we're heading in the same direction, I can help you out in your journey. And Mr. Snail is like, that would be great, Mr. Turtle. So he slimes his way up on the back of, of Mr. Turtle and everything and off on the journey the two of them go. And they're talking about life and everything that they're going through and stuff like that. And Mr. Turtle has, he's looking back talking to Mr. Snell and he doesn't see another turtle coming out and they collide. And so they stop there and the police show up. And the police start questioning everybody about what's happening and how it's going. And they come to Mr. Snell and they said, Mr. Snell, can you tell us what happened? He said, I don't think so. It all happened so fast. Different perspective. The snail thinks the turtle just books it, okay? And is in that when you and I, what's our perspective about a turtle and a snail? Yeah. Talk about slow. But because of those different perspectives, we see things differently. And because we see things differently, we can take that and we can look at that. And we can look at a situation and think, oh, okay, we understand what's going on. And it can cause us to really maybe not understand exactly what is happening in the situation. Again, another story I heard about a minister moved to a community, and he'd been in the community two, three weeks, and he decided one evening, it was a beautiful evening, he was going to go out and walk through the neighborhood and maybe meet some of his neighbors and just to get to, get to know the neighborhood a little bit better. 
So he's out walking. He's met a couple people. And as he turns the corner, he's going down the sidewalk. He looks up at this house, and there on the porch, he sees this little boy straining with everything he can, trying to get to the doorbell, doing everything he can to press the doorbell. And the minister's thinking, wow, what a neat opportunity for me to go up and help this young boy, to teach him as neighbors we help each other, and maybe a possibility to get to meet the family as well. So he walks up on the porch with the little boy, and he presses the doorbell and says, now what do we do? And the boy looks at him and laughs and says, run. <laughs> So some of you have done that too, I see. So, and so we have these different perspectives. And we make, honestly, I think, assumptions about what we think is going on or what we think things should look like. And unfortunately, we don't just do that in life, but we do that with Christianity. We bring it in, and when we talk about, hey, this is what it means to follow Christ, we're looking at it from what we believe, from my experience. Well, from what I've experienced, this is what it means. Instead of stopping and taking a look and say what that's cool what Dave thinks or that that's cool what you think or that but what does Jesus say about what a true follower of Jesus Christ looks like and that's why we've been studying it and taking a, a, a look at it and, and I think the reason we have have or one of the reasons that we have the wrong perspective and understanding on what it means is truly uh, to be a follower of Christ is because I think we we've come to be what I've heard called a rim hugger what's called a rim hugger. And I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but to help me explain what it means to be a rim hugger, I'm going to play this little clip from uh, a gentleman named Mark Batterson. Um, he's doing a teaching on this, and I want you to listen to what he has to say because I believe he gives an illustration in this part of his teaching uh, uh, of what he and his son experienced when they hiked the Grand Canyon. And I think it really does help us to understand how we can have the proper perspective on being a follower of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite things to do is go hiking with my family. Every once in a while, we'll come out here to the Billy Goat Trail just outside of Washington, D.C. And I've hiked the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu and Half Dome in Yosemite National Park. But of all of the life goals that I've achieved, hiking the Grand Canyon from rim to rim with my son Parker ranks right at the top of the list. It was a 23.2 mile hike with a one mile descent and ascent in elevation. And we did it in 110 degree temperatures. I lost 13 pounds in two days. Trust me, there are safer and easier ways to lose weight. Well, I pounded joints, used muscles that my body hadn't used in two decades. But my primary concern was the safety of my 12 year old son. I thought we had more than enough water in our packs, but we ran out and cramped up about three miles before reaching our day one destination. I kept monitoring Parker. How are you doing on a scale of one to 10? Well, the number kept dropping until finally he said negative one. Well, that's when I wondered if we were the overconfident hikers the park rangers warned us about who have to be airlifted out by helicopter. When we finally arrived at Phantom Ranch on the canyon floor, about dusk on day one, we had just enough energy to eat dinner and collapse in bed. The alarm went off at 4.30 the next morning, and we spent 10 hours zigzagging our way up the Bright Angel Trail. As the South Rim came into view, we saw hundreds of sightseers lining the rim, and that's when the contrast struck me. Our clothes were caked with canyon clay mixed with salty sweat stains. Flies hovered. The sightseers who lined the rim looked like they had just picked up neatly pressed clothes at the dry cleaners. We were parched and scorched. They looked like they had just emerged from their air conditioned hotel rooms after a cool shower. In fact, some of them were licking ice cream cones. For a split second, I felt sorry for myself, and then I felt sorry for them. Here's why. Because they were seeing it and missing it at the same time. You cannot truly see what you have not personally experienced. 
That's when I came up with a name for the people who stand and stare but never hike into the canyon. I call them rim huggers. I'm sure some of those rim huggers knew some things about the canyon that I didn't. Facts they had read in a travel guide or park brochure. So I guess you could say they know more about the canyon than we did, but it was nothing more than head knowledge. It was intellectual, not experiential. It was informational, not transformational. Hikers know the canyon in a way that huggers never will. Huggers may talk the talk, but hikers walk the walk. Here's the point. There's a world of difference between knowing about God and knowing God. The difference between those two things is like the distance between the North Rim and the South Rim with a canyon in between. You see, the character of God is like a Grand Canyon. In the words of A.W. Tozer, eternity won't be long enough to discover all that he is or praise him for all that he's done. But you don't get to know God by looking at him from a distance. You have to hike into the depths of his mercy and power and love and grace. You have to go rim to rim with God. It's not enough to sit in a church service for 60 minutes. Churches are filled with spiritual sightseers who feel like they've done their religious duty by sitting and listening. But you don't get credit for an audit. Going to church is a good thing, but sitting in a pew for 60 minutes is not God's ultimate plan for your life. In fact, church can actually undermine his plan by becoming a subtle form of spiritual codependency. We let someone else worship for us or study for us or pray for us. So instead of going all out for God, church becomes a bailout. So the question is this, are you a hugger or a hiker? Are you content with standing on the rim or are you willing to go all in and all out for God? And, and here at Winslow Christian Church, if you've been with us at all and, and you know that uh, we do missions trips here. As a matter of fact, um, the, the group that's been at Peru, they're on their way back. If you could keep them in your prayers, they're traveling. They're going to get back around midnight, one in the morning tonight and uh, uh, coming back. They've had an outstanding experience over there. And, um, but we do mission trips for the different ages and everything that we have and, and stuff. And, and we do that. We do that because these mission trips help people get off of being rim huggers and actually start going out and being valley walkers. See, I, I, you've maybe you've heard me say this before. One missions trip is worth more than 52 sermons. I want to say it again. One missions trip is worth more than 52 sermons. And if you've been on a trip, you understand exactly what I'm saying. If not, it's hard to understand. And, and the reason I say that, the reason I teach that, the reason I see that that's there, because I know people will say, Dave, I don't understand. Why do we have to go to Peru? Spend all that money, time, effort, and energy raising for a whole year and then ship them out for 10 days in Peru or, or even where we go in the U.S. We've been to New Orleans. We've been to Colorado. We've been all over the place here in the U.S. In my 18 years here, we, we've been... Why? When there's so much we could do right here. I mean, look at all the shelters in Springfield. And I completely understand that. And that statement's applicable to all ages, not just our high schoolers that go on these trips. But the reason is, is because when you go on these trips, you can't sit on the rim anymore. You can't hug the rim anymore. When you go on these trips, you have to be a doer. When you go on these trips, what happens is, all of a sudden, you no longer, as we said, a rim hunger. You're actually experiencing God. You're actually experiencing the Holy Spirit working in and through you to do things. And it's wonderful. And it's a blessing. And, and many times at the end of the trips, next Sunday is going to be Youth Sunday. The youth are going to be up here, and, and they're going to share a little bit of what happened. But you always see me call the youth and adults who went on that trip up here. So they can share a little bit, and you can hear how God worked on their heart. But the biggest reason I put them up here is because I want you to see their faces and to be praying for them. Because, you see, they experienced something that was there because they were forced to be doers. And I want you to be praying because the same Holy Spirit that they experienced that worked in and through them on these trips, wherever it is they go, is the same Holy Spirit that's with us right now that's in this community that wants them to do the same thing. Not be rim huggers, but to follow Christ and be a doer. 
And we struggle with that when we come back into our areas. We struggle with that ten fingers pointed here. We struggle when we get in our comfort area, our comfort zone, and life shows up and we have all these things to do. We forget what James tells us to do. We forget the challenge that James puts before us. Remember James chapter 1, verse 22? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You hear all the do, 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 do's, you know? <laughs> That's what it's about. And we've learned this here before at the WCC family, that most of us, we're educated way beyond our level of obedience. We really truly are, you know. And what we need is not another sermon, okay. And I'm not asking you to fire me after today. But what we need is not another sermon, you know. And don't get me wrong. Yes, we need to study the Word of God diligently, okay. But we don't need to know more. We need to do more with what we know. Let me say that again. We don't need to know more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. We need to do more with what we know about following Jesus Christ in our lives. See, at the end of my life, whenever this tent is put down to rest, God's not going to say, hey, well thought out, Dave. You know, come on in, my good and faithful. What's he going to say? Well done, my good and faithful servant a good and faithful servant. Mark, if we were to be able to play that video and actually play it a little bit further than what I was going to play today, he says he has a simple take on spiritual maturity. He says it's all about the theoretical becoming the experiential. And what he means by that is when you and I, when we sit down and we read a passage of Scripture, and it's nothing more than a passage of Scripture, we just read it and stuff like that, then it's theory because we haven't experienced it. Until you experience it for yourself, it's His grace. It's theoretical. But once you experience it, then it becomes a reality that starts to guide your life. That's why he gives us the promises and say, hey, step out and believe these promises. Over 7,000 promises in the scripture that we find that God says these are for us. When we follow him, these are the promises. When we obey him, here's some promises. And he says, put them, prove them, put them to practice. And when we do put them to practice and we see that God keeps his promises, we see that God delivers, then theory becomes a reality. And so over time, the Bible becomes less theoretical and more experiential to us. Verse by verse, the Bible becomes your spiritual reality, a reality that's far more, you know, far more real than the reality we could have with any of our, you know, previous or any, excuse me, any of our five senses that we have. I mean, we experience things with our senses, but the reality of the Bible coming to life, as we like to say, the living Word of God, seeing it act and, and stepping out on the promise and seeing God respond to that promise and keep that promise is more real than anything we can experience. That's why I think in the Hebrew language there's no distinction between knowing and doing. I don't know if you knew that. There's no distinction between knowing and doing. So knowing is doing and doing is knowing. In other words, if, if you aren't doing it, then you don't really know it. You're, you're what Mark would have said, what we were talking about here, that you're a, you're a rim hugger. So my encouragement as we wrap this up, my advice as we wrap this up, is I want us to take a hike. It's time to go all in by going all out. That's, that's why we spent almost two months reminding ourselves, or maybe learning for the first time, what it really means to be a true follower of Christ. I mean, we said that we've all been invited to follow Christ, but we can't just sit there as a spectator. I mean, say you're at the Grand Canyon right now, and you're on the rim, and it's not Mark Batterson coming up out of that. On the, it's Jesus Christ walking towards you. And he stops right in front of you and says, okay, everybody, I want you to follow me. And he turns and goes away. Now, you might be sitting there and you can see him and say, yep, I can still see him. You might even have a great pair of binoculars that you can look through and see him along. Yep, I still see him walking. But if you're still on that rim, you're not experiencing anything that he's experiencing on that journey that he's invited you to come along. To follow him, we have to go with him. And yeah, there's the prerequisite of being a sinner and, and everything that's there, but we all are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, but he doesn't want to leave us there. God's whole plan is for each and every day we become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. And we've been invited into this personal relationship. It's a relationship like you've heard me compare over the last couple months, uh, the last eight weeks, you've heard me, a relationship like you have with your spouse, your parents, your kids, your friends. But think about this. 
And that relationship, the relationships you have right now, I'll pick on husbands, okay? All right, husbands and wives, let's say you just got married. Actually, there's a couple in here that did just get married. Um, you just got married, okay? <clears throat> I won't pick on them too much, though. You just got married. You go on your honeymoon, you come back, your husband flops on the couch and starts saying, oh, honey, that's the way to vacuum. Oh, what, what, what's the way to cook that meal? Good job. That is great, honey. And then you go to bed and he gets up the next morning. That's the way to get ready for work, honey. Is he sitting on the couch? Oh, thank you. And, and as you drive away, he's got his binoculars watching you as far as he can, cheering you on. Go to work, earn some money. And he come back and there he is. Well, thank you for working so hard today. What's for supper? Would you still be married to that man? Oh, I forgot to say, don't say it out loud. Think this in your head. What, that, what kind of relationship would that be? Honestly, with a friendship, with any kind of relationship, if that was one-sided, like what would it be? And see, when we follow Christ, being a spectator is not what he's called us to be. He wants us to grow. He wants us to move. He wants us to be involved in this relationship. We have a part, and that's what Lauren was talking about in his devotion here today. You know, when he talked about being a doer, we have a part to give. And being a part of that. And we have to truly, if, if we're truly going to be known as a follower, then, you know, we've got to make that decision. Are we going to clothe ourselves? You know, are we going to clothe ourselves? Paul teaches us that there is clothing, not clothing that you and I look at, you know, but are we going to clothe ourselves? And unfortunately, because of the wrong perspectives today, when we talk about clothes, the literal clothes, so many people have it wrong. Not too far from where I was at a church in Iowa. And, and that uh, growing up, there was another church that was there. The minister and his wife would stand out front to greet you as you came in. And kind of like you see Gary and I greeting you and that. Uh, but they would stand there, and the minister's wife had a ruler. And ladies, if you came in slacks, if you were in slacks or jeans, you would be turned away at the door. No lady walked into the church with slacks on or jeans or shorts. Mm -hmm. And the ruler was to measure the length of your dress. If it wasn't long enough, you were turned away at the door. Now, see, that's a perspective. It's a wrong, 100% wrong perspective. Christ doesn't care anything about that. But see, when we try to look at it the way we think, you can't find that anywhere in Scripture. God doesn't care when you're doing the ministry. God doesn't care what you wear when you come in here. He cares about your heart. And that's why Paul says here in Colossians 3.12, this is what you're supposed to clothe yourself with. This is what we're supposed to be paying attention to. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to put on every day and dress so people will know whose we are. Because if you're being patient in this culture we live in today, <laughs> people are going to say, how can you be so patient? Wow, what an open door to share. How could you be so kind? How could you be so humble in that situation? Talk, we want to talk about experiencing you know, what that is like and when it comes to that aspect. And yes, I know we don't like to pray for patience, but guess what we have to pray for? Patience. Because when we do that, especially the humility part that we're talking about, when we call ourselves, then we can be the leader that God has called us to be. Not, not leading people so it benefits you, but leading people and raising them up. And I think the hard part of all this to understand is that if we're not willing to follow, if we're not willing to follow, to put movement to our Christianity, put hands and feet to what Christ has asked us to do, then what we've really chosen is not to follow in the first place. Or, or maybe you've been following. You know, we decided, you know, and, 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 and you've been taking the steps we've learned about the last two months. And, and if you haven't been able to be with us and miss some of it, you know, go ahead and go to our, our website, WilliamsvilleChristianChurch.com, and look and see, you know, look and see uh, of the perspective that God says, if this is what it means to be a follower. And, and maybe you chose to be that kind of follower, but then life shows up. And I understand life showing up. You know, and I understand that there's different times in life it's so much easier to follow Christ than there are to others. When Melinda and I first got married, we didn't have kids right away. You know, we didn't have those lovely rugrats running around. It was really easy for us to, you know, give 24-7, 365 to the church. It was just the two of us. We could go to the church together, be home, together, you know. And then all of a sudden, this kid came along that kept crying, needed diapers changed, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Then another one came along, you know, cried louder, needed more diapers, and that changed with it. And then they got a little bit older. They had school. They wanted to be involved in this crazy thing called sports. And they had school activities and band, da, 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 and all these things. About. So I know life happens and life comes with that aspect. And it can be very difficult. That's where the tension that we talk talked about can be of what do I choose? Who am I going to choose to stand up? Who am I going to choose to follow when it comes to that aspect? You know, so we have these tensions when it comes to that. 
But when we choose to say, you know what, I'm going to go this way, then whether we want to or not, we learned last week that we're making a choice to unfollow Christ. We're making a choice to unfollow Christ. I don't think in our hearts, I don't think anybody in here wants to make that choice. I think sometimes we just get used to it. We fall into it. Because maybe we don't have that right understanding, that proper perspective on what it truly, truly looks like, you know, when it comes to that. And I hope one of the greatest lessons that we can learn, you know, through this series and today, and be reminded of, is the church isn't a spectator sport, you know. I mean, in fact, you can't go to church, can you? Why? Because you are the church, if you let me stay on that play of words. We know the church is not a building who has the specific address. It's not a gathering at a certain time if you are the church. The church is happening whenever and wherever you are at. I mean, you hear about these multi-site churches all the time. And I like multi-site churches. I don't have anything against them. And if you're not familiar with a multi-site church, best example, I'll give you one example of how they do a multi-site church. Say we decided at WCC to do what uh, they say in the church community today is a multi-site church. We're here as the main campus, and then we want to reach more people in Sherman that are down there and, and, and that, so we decide and we rent out the, um, at the elementary school, we rent out the cafeteria, and we put in chairs, and one way that they'll do a multi-site church is they'll put a big screen and they'll broadcast this service. So those that are going to the, that show up down there, they would see everything that you're seeing, they just wouldn't, you know, see it live, they would see it on the screen, they'd hear the same worship, see me preaching and all that, and that could be classified as a multi-site campus, and they're happening because some churches, you know, that are in large cities and stuff like that, they're landlocked, they can buy property around and go do that. I, I think it's a wonderful thing, but I think something else that we forget today is multi-site church has been around since the very first church was created. WCC actually is, if you allow me to stay with this, a multi-site church, because your workplace is your mission field, all right? Your job, that's where you share your sermons. Your college, your school, that is your congregation. And that's why we're placed here on this earth. And that's what we're supposed to be about. Understanding what it means to follow Christ and going out and following him in these areas. The worship team is going to come up here and they're going to continue to allow us to worship God, to, to give him the praise and glory and honor he so rightly deserves in that. But as we take this time, as we get ready while they're, while they're leading us in the song, it's going to be a time that we get to focus, we get to remember, we get to celebrate, we get to reflect on what God has done for us through his son Christ. While they're singing, the elements are going to be placed in the back and on the side tables. You're free at any time to, to go and, and, and uh, you know, partake of the elements that remind us of that, remind us of that sacrifice of God's Son. But, but while you're sitting there and remembering and reflecting, one of the things I want to encourage you is to allow God's Spirit just to look at your heart and, 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 and take a look and, and ask yourself this. Where are you in this journey, in this walk, in this life of following Christ? You know, are you experiencing it literally because you're walking rim to rim? Are you getting yourself muddy and sweaty and mucky and everything because you're actually out there doing and serving and it's difficult and it's hard and, and that? Are you a rim hugger that's just kind of looking and, wa and watching and thinking, how can they do that? I don't understand how that person, well, they do that because they're experiencing it. Well, how come they hear God and that? Well, because they're experiencing it. There's a difference of being a rim hugger than being a walker. Or maybe, maybe you haven't even arrived at the Grand Canyon yet. <laughs> maybe you haven't even decided you want to make that vacation, make that trip out there. So I don't know where you are in your journey, but I want to encourage you right now as we take this time and we remember and we reflect and we celebrate to let God's Spirit speak to you and, 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 and answer the question, you know, where are you in that journey? And, and if you haven't made that trip, why haven't you? If you're standing right there and holding on to the rim as a rig hugger, why aren't you willing to experience it? And be out there and experience it. And then during this time, just pray that God will give you the wisdom and understanding of the steps that maybe you can and should take so you can become the follower that he's created us all to be. And while people are partaking of communion and, and everything, if, if there's prayer that you would like, if there's a decision you want to make, whatever that is, if you're comfortable, I'll be right up front up here. Come on up, and I'll pray with you and for you. If there's people with me, keep coming. If you're not comfortable in front of people, that's okay. You can catch me afterwards or some of the leaders afterwards or our information's in the bulletin because we're about doing life together, going through this journey together, experiencing it together, and that. So let's go before him right now. Father, 
I thank you so much for this time and this opportunity that we could gather together. As we said, we could come, we can worship you through song, Father God. We could give back to you through our offerings. Heavenly Father, we could just hear your word and be reminded, Father, of the beauty of your word and, and the encouragement that's there for us. We could take time, Father God, and remember the elements and the sacrifice of your son. And we thank you for what all this means right now to us, Lord. And as we get ready to just reflect and, and celebrate and give thanks, I pray that your spirit will speak to our hearts, Father. Help us to really honestly, just between you and us, Father God, help us to evaluate, where are we? Lord, where are we on this journey and this walk in our life with you, Father God? Help us to understand clearly what it is that you ask of us, why you ask that of us. And then, Father, fill us with the wisdom and the strength and all we need to get off the rim or to make the journey to start the experience of truly following you the way that you would have us follow you. Thank you so much for this. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.